Uh, so it was me or Groupon, I guess, right? Um, that's good. So um, I got about an hour, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, in the hour ahead, I hope to um, uh, pique some, some interest. Um, if I don't piss a couple people off, I won't have been successful. Um, I, I'm going to try to be a little provocative, and, but mostly what I want to do is just give you a perspective that I've um, developed over many years working with a ton of entrepreneurs, a lot of um, uh, companies, mostly dysfunctional, because that's what happens with companies, um, and just kind of you know share with you my perspective, and it is literally my perspective on this crazy thing um, called entrepreneurship and an even crazier thing called innovation. So. Um, the, the title of this, of this talk is in, Enlightenment, Enchantment, and Entrepreneurship, and hopefully in the course of this I will cover all of that. Um, the, the, the talk is, you, you're not going to see a lot of words up here. Um, I, I sort of ascribe to the theory that a picture is worth at least 10,000 words these days, inflation. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to sort of dive deep into some perspective on, on uh, what I think is going on in the world of entrepreneurship and innovation. And then at some point we're going to take a little bit of a right-hand turn. And I wanted to share with you a little bit of an emerging, um, um, some emerging thoughts I've had recently about uh, innovation and uh, what I call the core competencies of innovation. If, if, if I could write a book, and I'm probably not capable of it, but if I were to ever write a book, it would be uh, about this emerging core compen competencies. Uh, and by the way, none of these core competencies, to the best of my knowledge, are being uh, taught um, anywhere at Northwestern, which is interesting since there's a lot of really smart people here teaching really smart people um, with the hope of creating you know, future innovators. So, um, so with that in mind, uh, this is all about sort of the realities of entrepreneurship. Um, and the first one is, um, and, I, and I realize I'm being a little provocative here uh, intentionally, the first one is that um, most people have this perception that um, entrepreneurs um, somehow get hit by lightning or maybe it happens to them in an odd moment in a shower that this idea comes to them or him or her. And I want to try to get get across here, um, and if there's any kind of meta message here, it's, it is that, in fact, uh, it's not lightning. It's not um, a random, you know, thought that comes into your head. It, it actually is rarely, if ever, a personal experience that turns out to be, you know, the big innovation. Um, but it's a, it's a bunch of other things. Um, but it is, it is clearly not lightning. Uh, lightning is not a very creative force. If you've, anybody in the room been hit by lightning? Um, I guess way, way, way back, one could argue, any biochemists in the room? You know, lightning somehow had to do with, you know, binding some, you know, amino acids together and, you know, or it was alien visitation. But I don't know, and I'm not getting into that, but it is clearly not a very uh, constructive force and it's not a very creative force. Um, in, in, in reality, um, what innovators tend to do is draw on uh, a deep insight that they, that they have, and I'm going to explain a little bit about the me methodology of, of insight, uh, as opposed to just, you know, intuition. Now, if you're a social scientist and, you know, kind of understand um, the, the difference <laughs> between insight and intuition, you know, you'll realize that, um, at least if you, hopefully you'll agree, that insight is a little bit of a higher level um, processing of, of information and experience as opposed to intuition which uh, can be very helpful and, and there have you know, been some really great books like Blink and other things written about this, this whole topic of intuition. Uh, but it turns out, if, again, if you go and study some of the great innovators, they rely on uh, insight over intuition and it, it's an important distinction. Um, and their insights are all about human behavior. This is my, one of my favorite pictures for those of you who don't really get what's going on here. Um, so, you know, it turns out that uh, people are kind of unusual and, um, and we're all very creative and we all sort of make our world work for us in various ways. 
Uh, and we all have what might look like odd and unusual behaviors, but you know, from a social scientist point of view, um, if you literally look at behaviors, they, they, with the exception of like criminals and people like that, mostly human behavior makes sense, right? You might need to understand the context of, human, of the human behavior for it to make sense um, like this, but um, in general, it is these human behaviors upon which these insights are drawn, right? And, you know, I don't know what your exact insight out of this is, except, you know, I would argue that maybe there shouldn't be a down escalator, but um, needless to say, um, you know, this is working for, for some people in some way, and it is the job of the social psych psychologist or anthropologist to try to figure this out. Um, and underlying all of these behaviors are typically some unmet needs. Now, you know, the unmet need here may be pretty obvious, which is, you know, maybe this is a 24-hour fitness facility for morbidly obese people, and, and just to get them into the facility, you somehow have to, you know, give them a little bit of lift. Um, but it is almost always the case that the big innovations are an unmet need, right? And it is the job of the innovator to to discover and uncover those unmet needs through the observation of, of human behavior. And it might be a very simple little thing, and it might be a very subtle little thing that you notice. Um, this young child trying to, you know, buy um, some ice cream. Uh, clearly, you know, I would imagine if you did a demographic study of who's buying products out of this vending machine, it would trend towards smaller, shorter people, and yet um, it was designed in a way you know, I mean, if, it, if I could find the picture, what would really be great is if the beer were at a lower level <laughs> and the ice cream were, were at a higher level, but um, I, I haven't been able to find that picture. Um, the point here is that it's almost always an unmet need that is driving innovation. Um, since we're in, the, we're in the Ford building, you know, I, I'll, I'll quote Henry Ford, and I'm sure all of you have heard this, that, you know, there was a time Henry Ford was, was quoted as saying, you know, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, right? And, um, you know, th this is sort of the, the sort of focus group bashing, and, and I'll repeat this a number of times, I'm sure. Um, you, you just can't actually ask people what they want because you will, you will get a perfectly reasonable answer and it will likely lead to, it could lead to some kind of very small incremental feature or addition to an existing thing, but it is rarely going to give you, you know, the sort of big idea that, you know, we're all hoping to get rich on. Instead, it almost always comes from an unmet need. And if we think, I mean, one of the classic uh, case studies in, in the world of innovation is, you know, Apple's brilliant um, development of the iPod and the iTunes. So any, anybody have any guesses as to what the there were two core underlying observations and unmet needs that, you know, that caused the iPod and iTunes magic to happen. Anybody have any, like, ideas as to what those were? Any that might have remembered? Yeah. Right, that is one of them. Right, people were buying, I mean, I don't know if you may remember where people buy CDs anymore, but if, you know, back in, in the day when they were like $15, $18, you'd buy the CD of a favorite group, but you might only like one song, right? So that was, that was one of the behaviors that, that Steve and company sort of saw and, and leveraged. What was the other one? Uh, I, I think that was, that was a problem that could have been solved, but the Henry Ford answer would have been, if, you, if Steve Jobs had asked people what they wanted, they would have said, I need a 60 CD, you know, wallet or carrying case. Remember that they made like visor units? I mean, there were all kinds of crazy things. I, I think that was, that's a great example of a need, but it wasn't the innovation driver. There's, a, there's another huge one, and it has more to do with iTunes than it does the iPod. People were stealing music. Right? There were a bunch of uh, probably young um, geeks um, who figured out how to digitize music and share it without you know, ha anybody having to pay for it. In the, even in the pre-Napster days, 
uh, people were stealing music. And, and they still are stealing music, of course, but um, what, what Steve noticed was people listening to one, one song at a time and you know, people forced to steal music because they, that you know, one, one song was costing him $15. And he, and he did what, what the classic great innovator does, which is he asks the impossible question. And the impossible question was, well, how do I um, disrupt the entire music industry as a little computer company with less than 10% share of the, of the computer market and no uh, presence in the music industry? So that's impossible question number one. Possible question number two is how do I sell somebody a song one at a time, you know, maybe for 99 cents. And impossible question number three is how do I, you know, create a music device that will play one song at a time, you know, that doesn't require, you know, a, a suitcase full of CDs. So these were all unmet needs. These were all latent needs. And all he did was sort of put on his anthropological glasses and realize that those existed. Um, in many cases, and I think the iPod is a, is a good, good example of this, you find these great insights and these unmet needs not by looking at the middle of the curve, but by going way out on the extremes. Now, I, I mean, I, I don't know what the inspiration you could draw from this might be, other than this is like a one yak powered vehicle um, in Thailand. But, um, the point is that if that if you if you are <coughs> if you are an entrepreneur and you are trying to be innovative and you know reasonably successful, uh, you want to as much as possible abandon any sense of reason and any sense of judgment in the early stages of generating an idea, right? And this is the hardest thing for for human beings to do. We are all constantly living in an evaluative model, right? Somebody says, well, I have an idea, and it's so easy for us to say, well, that, that idea really sucks, right? Everybody is constantly judging things. And if you wanna be an entrepreneur, you have to somehow get into a generative mode, um, almost you know, more like a crazy artist that you know, makes something that nobody can understand, as opposed to a business person who's thinking very rationally. There's plenty of time later in the process to be rational and, and judgmental and evaluative, but if you're trying to have a good idea, it's a really good idea to sort of suspend judgment, right? And part of that is going way out on the extremes and not focus on the middle of the, of the, of the curve. Now, you know, having done this kind of work for major corporations for you know, a couple of decades, I can tell you this is not a particularly comfortable thing. They always want to know right from the beginning, is this a good idea? Is the market big enough? You know, how come you're not doing a sample size, research size of, you know, 500 people when in fact all we would ever do is go sort of observe three or four people, right? But way out on the extremes, right? If you're, you know, trying to design a, I'm going to make up an artificial client here. If you're going to try to design a, a new delivery vehicle for Thailand, you're going to learn more about um, and be more inspired by the future of delivery vehicles in Thailand talking to this guy and watching what he's doing than you're ever going to uh, by, you know, finding a guy with a really nice truck, right? Um, and, you know, one of the, by the way, this is a real picture. Uh, this is not Photoshop. Uh, these are some very hungry goats. Yeah. Sorry, I had a question about the, the last slide. Yeah, yeah. You don't have a question about this slide? <laughs> <laughs> the last slide? Okay. All right. <laughs> if, if you're in the generative part of the process, uh, the response is, I have no idea. Right? We'll, we'll get to that later. But they've hired us, me, to think about something that doesn't exist. Right? So, and we'll get to this in a little bit. Nobody has any idea as to what the market size of something that doesn't exist is. Like, Steve Jobs had no idea whether iPod and the iTunes model was going to be successful. I mean, I think he had a reasonable sense of it, but, you know, there were no projections. Um, so, 
Um, and here's another thing. So if, if, if human beings have a hard time getting out of their, their mental model of judging things all the time and evaluating an idea, um, we are often, um, you know, really caught up in our heads, especially since we're here in academia and everybody is, is all, you know, focused on thinking and having really good ideas. Um, it's, it's actually very important to suspend disbelief and try to engage all of your other senses other than your just the sense of thinking and being in your head, right? And, and you know, literally look at something as if it's um, a fresh and, and new thing, even though you've seen it a million times. Um, famous, um, recently departed, one of my favorite comedians ever, uh, George Carlin, referred to this in a brilliant way a few years ago. Um, really brilliant, actually. Um, so we all know what this thing um, called deja vu is, right? It's something that you've seen, um, that you see reminds you of, you know, something from before, right? Um, but he came up with this term called vuja de, which is sort of the reverse of deja vu, where um, you see something that you've seen a thousand times, a hundred times before, and for the first time you see it with fresh eyes, right? Because you, you, you're able to kind of get out of your bias um, and, and see something, you know, incredibly, um, uh, something you've seen a million times, but see it with fresh eyes, right? And this is one of the reasons that, um, you know, back when I was with IDEO, I was, you know, I was some, somewhat on the front lines of talking to potential clients and, you know, if a client called up and said, you know, we're a major manufacturer of, um, uh, I don't know, atomic microscopes or something, and we want to know if you're interested in designing our next atomic microscope, and we want to know how much experience designing atomic microscopes you have, and if they were looking for an answer like, well, we've designed 50 atomic microscopes, I would hang up the phone, right? We did actually our best work when we were completely ignorant of the product area, the service area, the industry, the domain. Like, we were able to come in with that sort of blissful ignorance. Um, and so, you know, as a, as a great friend of mine said once, when I, when I first started, you know, working in the design industry, he said, be, be careful what you get really good at and what you become really familiar with, because it will bias you forever, right? And so, um, one of the things that IDEO is really good at is kind of creating that blissful ignorance and bringing teams together that, you know, just are unencumbered by, um, you know, some pre-existing knowledge or experience in a particular industry. Now, it might be helpful, you know, this doesn't apply to everything. So, you know, if you're, if you're in need of brain surgery, it's probably a good idea to find a brain surgeon that has some experience and isn't coming to it fresh and new. But in the world of innovation, this ability to kind of create vuja de in your mind is incredibly important, right? So thanks to George Carlin for that. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, this is not about um, talking to people. I, you know, I'm not suggesting that it, great innovators are somewhat antisocial. Um, Steve Jobs actually is antisocial, but um, from what I can tell. Um, but it is more about going through the experience and sort of immersing yourself in the experience that people are having um, as, as it is about talking to them or even observing them. You almost want to sort of empathically become them in the course of, if you're trying to get insights. By the way, I don't know if anybody ever uh, experienced this. Um, anybody know what this is? So this was it. Yeah, somebody knows, finally. I've asked this question. Hmm? Yeah, it's the Tate in London. So it was a, this is a, an old abandoned, um, this story has no relevance to the talk, but, um, well it does in a way. It's an old abandoned power plant, so it's a huge volume of space. I mean, imagine a football field four stories high inside build, of a building. I mean, you could park an airplane in this thing. Um, maybe two or three stories high, and an artist did an installation where the entire ceiling of this building was a mirror, and there was this huge orange light at one end. And um, 
It was an incredibly quiet space. Uh, first of all, it was just like a glow in this orange light. And without any instructions, um, people would come here at all hours of the day and literally just lie down on the concrete floor. Because if you did that, um, you would quickly realize that in about, I don't know, it took about, took about 15 seconds for me. All of a sudden, you were looking up at your reflection in the mirror, and you would start to like float. You had this really bizarre floaty experience, and like for the I think this is gone now, but for the for the period of time that this was at the Tate Museum, I mean this was the biggest selling drug in London. I mean it was unbelievable, you know, and it was all about this experience, um, and a, just a brilliant art installation. I never never really found out too much about the artist, but. You know, if this artist like had any sense of this, in, what was going to happen in advance, you know, they're they're truly brilliant. Um, and to the point, you know, this ability to sort of immerse yourselves in the lives and experiences of other people to get these insights is all about empathy, right? It's all about really like being there in the moment, understanding the context in which you exist, and like sort of paying attention in a fundamentally different way. This is my favorite picture of not paying attention. Um, so empathy is super, super important. We, we would do work where um, we would try as much as possible not to be the anthropologist, so to speak. I mean, it's important to have that anthropological view, but to literally become, you know, be with and become the people that we were studying, right? Um, that, that led to led to a lot of very interesting experiences and stories which I can't get into, but um, believe me, uh, you know, you had to literally immerse yourselves into their lives in order to see and understand what they were doing and why they were doing it. Um, there's a famous, um, you know, anybody in here have Bank of America Keep the Change program? Right. So that, that project, um, which was quite a few years ago, um, involved um, literally a team of people immersing themselves in the lives of, I believe it was sort of 18 to 24 year old uh, women, right? And, you know, since I have a daughter in that age range, you know, sort of observing all of the bizarre behaviors that occur in, in, in that demographic. Um, for example, you know, I, I would notice that my daughter would, you know, without any question spend $2.50 to take $20 out of an ATM, right? Like, it didn't really, it just didn't, she didn't make the connection between the cost of doing that and, or in the case of Keep the Change, what we noticed was, and you would never have gotten this if you had asked anybody this question, but by being there and watching and being in their lives and watching them pay their bills, we started to notice that um, these people would would get a Verizon bill for like $56 and they'd write a check for $60 to Verizon, right? They'd kind of pay forward a little bit. And we saw this time and time again and it was sort of odd behavior. I mean, nobody, anybody in this room pay more to, a, to somebody if you have a bill? Do you ever like write it up a little bit? Nobody does it. By accident, maybe. But they were doing it because they didn't trust themselves to have any money next month, right? And it unlocked this unmet need, which is actually people want to save money, they just can't figure out how to do it, right? And Bank of America Keep the Change was all about a passive digital piggy bank, right? And how do you, how do you change the relationship between the bank and the customer so that the bank is actually, I mean, anybody in this room think banks are helping you? <laughs> right. Um, but in this case, it did shift that perception and all of a sudden, you know, Bank of America customers thought the bank is helping me. And in the first year of that program, by the way, um, they attracted a huge number of new clients who saved a, a billion dollars. That, and this is a group of people that never saved any money, right? So good for the bank, good for the people. Um, a little, little uh, side alley here. You know, especially these days, entrepreneurs seem to be all focused on technology. Like, it's all about the technology and you know, it's like the technology is driving, is driving innovation um, as opposed to being a tool that enabled innovation. And I just thought I'd like mention this because it's not to say that technology can't be a driver 
and that it, it isn't in and of itself innovation, you know, at some fairly high level. Um, but these days, you have to just be careful what's driving what, right? And, and these things have to be in, in, you know, proper balance. We have, you know, we have this, you know, wild, wild world of social media that's occurring and it's changing, you know, everything. I, you know, I, I, um, I actually believe that um, we, what we're seeing in the Middle East, um, to go way off on a tangent, I think Mubarak was the first case of, of, uh, of a leader that was outed on Facebook, right? I mean, it, it turns out that like political assassination is, is sort of old news and not very relevant when you can sort of corrupt and change things just through social media. So, but you just have to be careful that it's not the driver because it isn't innovation. Innovation needs to use technology. Um, so I know, I know at Northwestern in various programs, especially Kellogg, I think even at McCormick, you know, there's this sort of focus on business plan. I, 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 sus, I, I suspect there are still business plan competitions. Is that true? Thanks. Right. Right. So I, I've probably seen, I don't know, what, almost a thousand business plans in my life. Um, I pride myself on the ability to get to the, the, the page that has the biggest lie on it within about 20 seconds. I can, I can you know, do it very quickly. Um, I've never seen a business plan come true. Uh, they're either wildly high or wildly low. It would be a complete accident if they ever came true. Um, and I think it's an interesting um, uh, sort of intellectual exercise. Um, but what I, what I think is, is a far better intellectual exercise is to actually have a great idea, right? As opposed to being able to write a brilliant plan about the idea. Um, spend the time, the money, resources, whatever you have, um, li as limited as they may be, which is a good, a good thing, by the way, but we'll get to that. Um, and, you know, focus on having a great idea, not on writing a great business plan. Um, I know it may seem like a lot of people, you know, want to see that great business plan, and it's really, it's super important to the future, um, but I'm, I'm just here to tell you that it's almost meaningless at some level. Um, and one of the reasons it's meaningless is because they're incredibly inaccurate, especially when you get to that one page that has, you know, cash flow, for example, right? Um, you know, where it shows that finally in year three, you emerge from your, you know, from, an, from all the red ink and you start making money, right? Rarely true. Um, you might make money right away or never, but it's never going to be in that sort of magic three and a half year period that everybody says they're going to make money. Uh, venture capitalists are, um, who still do want to see a business plan, um, but they don't really spend too much of their time looking at the numbers. What they spend their time looking at is the people, right? And that, that's often, you know, like on the last page, there's a little three sentence bio of all the people involved. I would spend like the first 40 pages talking about the people. Um, uh, so in this ideas business that we're all talking about here, um, and, and this, this notion of having a great idea, I'm, I'm here to tell you that just having a lot of ideas isn't going to cut it, right? It's got to be the quality of the ideas. Um, now, it, it is helpful to have a lot of ideas and filter through them somehow. Um, and we can talk later about how to filter through them. But it turns out that the quality of the idea is what is super important and is highly correlated with success, right? Um, not just having a lot of ideas or imagining that they're all going to stick. Um, one of the big dysfunctions of uh, corporate America is, um, and I actually think this is um, systemic. It's not just corporate America. It act, it's, its origins are in our education system. And, um, and that is that, you know, companies will, will inevitably believe that everything they do is going to be successful, right? And it turns out that, you know, some of the research proves that in, in terms of all innovation efforts, only about in the single digits, maybe 9 or 10 percent are actually successful. Um, but yet, you know, all CEOs think that every dollar they spend on innovation is going to be you know, yield them some result. It rarely is, is true. 
Um, in fact, um, we were talking about resources a little earlier. Uh, resource scarcity is far more highly correlated with the ability to be innovative than just an abundance of resources. So um, most big companies, um, are almost, it's almost improbable that they will ever innovate and do something terribly disruptive. Uh, they're much more likely to be disrupted by, um, you know, two people um, in a garage somewhere funding the entire operation out of a stolen credit card. Um, or worse, uh, no money whatsoever. Um, you know, we see, what, what I started to see, especially in the, maybe the, you know, late 80s and 90s was large, large companies coming to the realization that they can't really innovate and they would take groups of people and put them in little skunk works programs where they would, you know, um, either not give them any food or water and just sort of lock them in a, you know, dark basement somewhere and just say, you know, innovate or die or they'd, they'd take them out of the context of, you know, Dilbert land and, you know, allow them to actually like have some fresh air and, and you know, some sunlight and, and magically innovation tended to happen more frequently in those environments. Um, but it is, it is highly correlated with, innovation is highly correlated with actual uh, limited resources, not an abundance of resources, which is not particularly good news to major corporations. Um, but it is, in my opinion, the truth. Um, now, now here, here's one of the, in my opinion, the biggest um, misconceptions about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs. Um, in general, they tend to be loners. Um, now, they, they might be particularly effective at uh, engaging and enrolling people in, in their, their vision, um, but this, this notion of sort of isolation and solitude can be an absolutely huge problem if you're actually expecting to be um, successful in any way. It turns out that, you know, as uh, David Kelly, the, one of the founders of IDEO, once famously said, nobody is as smart as everybody. Um, and it does take a team. There are rarely, if ever, any cases of real, uh, systemic, sustained innovations in the world that didn't involve a team of people. Even if it looks like just Steve Jobs did it on, did it on his own, or Henry Ford, or Thomas Edison, um, there was always a team of people that were quite diverse uh, that were involved. Um, and it turns out this notion of diversity is again one of these counterintuitive human uh, behavioral things. Most people and most entrepreneurs tend to surround themselves with people just like them, right? And, and even out in the workforce, what you see is employers, I don't know, how many people have been on a job interview? I'm sure many of you, right? So what, what can tend to happen is the person that is interviewing for the job is sort of looking for somebody just like them, right? They're trying to sort of surround themselves with people that are, it's like a mutual admiration society. Um, and it turns out it is exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, IDEO broke the mold a little bit in that. I mean, we would, we would rarely, if ever, hire people that were like us. Uh, there is a little bit of a, a, a conundrum here and that is that culture is important. So you, you do want to have people that are, are you know, capable of perpetuating a common culture. I mean culture in the, in the business sense. Um, and, and sometimes that looks like it takes people just like you, uh, but diversity is a very magic thing. And um, you know, companies like Google and, and IDEO and, and others are particularly good at maintaining a culture, yet keeping a very rich and diverse workforce. Um, if you find yourself in a, in a school project, on a, on a job project, and all the people are of the same background as you, you're in serious trouble, um, generally speaking. So um, if you have the opportunity to you know, um, do some work and some of the work I'm going to show you with these core competencies was done by one of the most amazing, di amazingly diverse groups of people I've ever met um, and ever been on a team with. We had um, dancers, um, musicians, uh, poets, theme park designers, you know, just an amazingly rich, diverse group of people. There, you know, there, if, if there were two engineers in the room, they would have killed each other. Um, 
So diversity is a, is a big deal. Um, and beware, be wary of the genius, especially the lone genius. Um, they're incredibly corrupting, especially if they're particularly good salespeople. Now, fortunately, uh, geniusness, if that's a word, and great you know, salesmanship don't always highly correlate. Many, many geniuses are, are, are sort of antisocial, thankfully, and incapable of enrolling a lot of people, but except for the, the cult folks. But um, just be wary of that lone genius that's sitting in a garage somewhere has this you know, grand vision of what, you know, um, of, of reversing gravity or something. Um, now, now here's, here's something that's going to be particularly shocking to, to people. Um, and I, I, you know, having talked to many, many people, uh, entrepreneurs on the phone with a great, you know, with, with anything from a really terrible idea to a potentially good idea, um, almost always they thought that, you know, getting a patent is going to be really, really important. Um, and we were talking earlier about the patent fight, you know, between, anybody remember the patent fight between Apple and Microsoft over the mouse, right? And, um, you know, where ultimately it was concluded that they both stole it from Xerox. Um, the people that got really wealthy out of that were the lawyers, right? And there are a lot of people, there, there are two folks, um, this is the first uh, profession I'm going to tell you to be wary of, lawyers. Now, I, I have some friends that are lawyers. I've been accused of acting like a lawyer at times. But I'm telling you that um, there, are, there are, are any number of lawyers out there telling you that it is super important to get protection for your idea, right? Um, I can tell you kind of off the record that a lot of companies, with the exception of bio, you know, pharma co companies that, you know, where they do want to sort of protect a molecule for some reason, all, even, although even that is, is being disrupted right now because you can so quickly change, you know, you can do a designer molecule and just change the thing very slightly and render, you know, a, a $60 million research patent, you know, null and void. Um, but speed to market is, is the prevailing paradigm these days. Um, it may be nice to get um, some kind of protection if you feel it's necessary. Um, I think it's probably more important to get, you know, to, to kind of keep things somewhat confidential as opposed to, um, you know, going the patent route. But um, speed to market almost always trumps patents these days. And there will be thousands of people in your way wanting to take money to get a patent. Um, it turns out, for those of you who don't know, the entire patent system, which was invented in the United States, the entire patent system was not about making something secret. It was about making it public um, and, and, you know, creating some fairness around monetization of an idea. Um, if you really want to keep something secret, you want to create a trade secret, like, you know, the formula for, for Coke or Pepsi. Um, so just keep in mind that, you know, getting something into the market Winning and moving on to the next thing is far more um, beneficial than trying to protect things. Now, I, I know that you know Apple um, does does file for patents. Interestingly, they, they they tend to file design patents, right? So what they what they're trying to protect actually is the you know the sort of physical object, the look and feel of the physical object, not the fact that it's you know an MP3 player married to a, a business model. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of cases of, of um, and some great people around Northwestern. If, you've ever, if you ever have an opportunity to take a class with James Connolly, he's, he's an absolutely brilliant guy. And, and he'll, he'll, you know, he could speak for entire semesters on this topic. Um, but there may be cer certain things that are important, especially when they start to relate to the brand, right? And he'll tell you, he uses a case study of, you know, the, the, uh, AstraZeneca, I think, it's purple pill. Everybody remember the purple pill? So AstraZeneca doesn't own the molecule. They own the color purple, right? Harley Davidson owns the sound of that motorcycle through trademark and trade dress, not through patents. Um, turns out patents expire. Trademarks and trade dress never expire. So AstraZeneca, own, I think it's AstraZeneca, owns that color purple forever, right? Um, so. Um, I couldn't find a great picture of a patent, so this is what I came up with. Um, 
And, and here's, you know, this is uh, trending into politics, which you should never talk about. But back to my uh, discussion about what's wrong with the school system. You know, if you think about it, what's, what's really wrong with the world is that we, we, we still are operating in, under the belief that it's a zero-sum game, that somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. Um, our whole education system is based on grades, you know, on a curve, and, the, and, and the, this focus on getting the right answer, and it turns out that you only learn something when you get the wrong answer, right? So the whole grading system is completely broken. The whole education system is really broken. And, and more importantly, we build entire organizations, companies, schools, you know, any organization that we, that we create on this sort of command and control. I mean, we really have not, you know, gotten much beyond um, the medieval approach to, you know, military thinking and winning at all costs and somebody has to lose and somebody has to win, somebody has to get an A, somebody has to get a D. Um, and that's sort of what's wrong with the whole system. Um, and what you're starting to see, especially with really clever entrepreneurs, and um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give the Groupon guys a little credit here. You know, what they what they have done is innovated in the in the area of cooperation with their enemies in a lot of ways, right? So, this whole sort of coopetition and frenemies ways of thinking about your organization, your products and services that might take advantage of, of uh, people that you thought you were competing with is really what it's about. Um, there are many, many cases, especially in the automotive industry now, where um, if you literally took a car apart um, you know, of a particular brand, you will see that it contains the brands of other cars. Um, I have a, uh, I own an Audi that has um, a system developed by Daimler Chrysler in it. And you'll see subsystems being shared between Toyota and even Nissan, you know, like companies that were warring in the past. So if you, if you can somehow like abandon this notion of like winning and, you know, the, the, um, the new winning, um, made famous by all kinds of, you know, really dysfunctional Hollywood people these days, um, and, and not think of it as a zero-sum game, you, especially in, if you're, you know, hoping to innovate and be an entrepreneur, it'll be very helpful. Um, because, as I said, you don't ever learn anything by getting it right, right? Yet the entire system is, is focused on that. Um, and in fact, you know, failing, which this is my best failing picture. Um, <clears throat> I, I think these guys are going to learn something here. Uh, they're going to probably learn it the hard way. I think. Well, I don't think. I know alcohol was involved in this decision. Uh, and by the way, this is. Sorry. This is in. This is in the UK. This is like. Um, this is 240, right? This is this is serious, right? This is, this is not just your little, you know, 110 volt problem. Um, so, um, and and you know, the, this gets at the whole question of how corporations are set up, how school is set up, you know, grading and promotions and, and all of that. And, you know, we're, we're actually far better off if we, if we try to learn as much as we can from failure as opposed to just promoting the people that always win, right? Um, and this gets at the whole, uh, and here's the second, the second group of people to be wary of. Um, I can't tell you how many times I used to get calls from you know, budding young entrepreneurs that would ask, <clears throat> you know, didn't really have an idea what IDEO did, but they would ask if we could help them make a prototype. And I would say, well, why do you want to make a prototype? Well, we want to make a prototype so we can show people and we can get money so we can actually make this product. Bad, bad, bad idea. At some point it might be a reasonable idea and a really nice model of which this is one, you know, where it, where it in fact helps tell the story of the product isn't a bad thing. Um, but a prototype will create wealth for you because what prototypes do, endless iterations of crappy, really terrible looking prototypes is that, I'm sorry, they will, they will help you ask questions that you forgot to ask, right? Um, and you know, this is a, this is a project that's um, you know, been publicized quite a bit. Um, because it was, it was documented so well. 
and it was around a piece of surgical equipment. And these are the prototypes that we were showing to clients and we were, sh we were showing to the doctors, right? Here, here's a big lesson. Um, if you haven't learned this, let's see who this is. It's my wife, I don't need to talk to her. Okay, so <clears throat> if, you, if you make a prototype that looks like this, and you show it to somebody and put it down on the table and say, what do you think of this, right? What, do you, what kind of feedback do you expect to get? Reasonably, reasonably good, right? It, this looks like a pretty convincing model of something. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but um, here's a really interesting thing that happens. The nicer the prototype, the, the more dishonest feedback you will get. Right? And the reason is nobody, we're, we're, we're human beings. Nobody wants to hurt anybody else's feelings, right? If it looks like it's, you know, made out of like, you know, dirty clay sticks, toothpicks, and tape, you know, and it, it doesn't look like you have a terrible amount invested in it, but it actually tells a story, you're likely to get really good feedback, all right? Because all of a sudden people go, well, it doesn't look like Tom has a lot invested in this, he just really wants me to focus on the idea, not the quality of the model, um, I'm likely to get better feedback, right? So this is a bad way to go, and models like this, these kinds of prototypes that actually help you get some, some proper feedback, help you ask questions that you forgot to ask, um, and, and get a kind of validation of, of some of the thinking, whether it's ergonomics or, you know, cord management, whatever it happens to be, this is going to be far more um, helpful. And there are endless numbers of, you know, prototyping shops out there that will take thousands and thousands of dollars of your money to make a perfect looking thing. Most of the time it's a big waste of time and money, okay? Um, now, another thing I heard time and time again is, you know, uh, depending, in, independent of, of the idea. Well, how do you expect to actually market this idea? Who are you going to sell this idea? Well, we're going to sell it over the internet, right? Sounds like a great idea, and I know there's a lot of sales that happen over the internet. Um, but if you haven't thought through uh, a distribution channel in a pretty robust way, and you're relying on quote unquote internet sales, uh, game over. Um, I wish I had a picture of one of these things, but many years ago we did a project for 3Com that was this sort of uh, weird uh, PDA that would live in your kitchen. Uh, it was actually an interesting idea way ahead of its time. And this was 3Com that was, you know, uh, had a great brand, brand, great brand recognition. They were deeply invested in uh, a lot of um, uh, business to business. They were moving into the consumer world. Um, not unlike Cisco now, who's moving into the into you know home routers and things like that, um, and they made this product, and the only store they were able to get it in was Bloomingdale's, right? This is a piece of like electron home electronics that was being sold at Bloomingdale's. Anybody see anything wrong with that, right? Like, it was a miserable failure. Uh, as a result, they expected to sell a lot over the internet. Um, this was sort of in the er somewhat early days of the internet. Um, but it was just a complete failure. And time and time again, I hear from entrepreneurs, you know, they've, you know they, they believe that if they build it, they will come, right? And it is almost never the case. Um, it is a really huge hurdle to introduce anything new into the marketplace, especially if it's, if it's sort of disruptive in any way. Um, I mean, there's nothing like the present to hold us back from the future. Um, and this whole notion of channel and distribution is super, super important. Um, and if you're going to ever write a business plan, you know, second to the people, you should be talking about this. Um, now, we've talked about leadership um, and, and organization quite a bit here. Um, but the, the, I want to kind of hammer home this point one more time. And that is that um, we, we tend to, uh, human beings tend to um, dysfunctionally organize um, and create all forms of of, of strange hierarchies um, and uh, command and control structures because we think that's the way it works. And it turns out that nature sort of doesn't like a lot of structure. It, it actually, you know, there are laws of entropy. It likes a lower state of energy 
Um, and if you have an opportunity to create an organization and have it be like incredibly flat, you're far better off. Um, about six years ago, when IDEA was only, I think, three or four hundred people, I think it was a Kellogg class that did a, did a research project, um, interviewed a whole bunch of like 250 people they interviewed at IDEO trying to like drill in, there was a case study written, um, drill into like how does this all work and they asked all 250 people who their boss was and I can proudly report that nobody could answer the question, right? It's, and we thought it was a really good thing, right? If you don't know who you're, I never knew who my, I was there for over 12 years and I, I absolutely to this day have no idea who my boss was, right? And you know, some people can't live in that kind of a structure, and we didn't hire those kinds of people, fortunately. Um, but what it was all about was leadership. Like, who, who, what, were you able to kind of create, you know, some momentum and a following as opposed to just fit into some title? Nobody had titles. Nobody knew who their boss was, um, and you know, the results were were still to this day kind of legendary. Okay. We're going to take a little fork in the road here. Um, this is the only picture I could find of a fork in the road. So, um, and I just thought I'd share with you kind of in closing um, what I'm calling entrepreneurial competencies. Uh, it might also be, you know, innovation competencies. Um, and I just want you to notice carefully that I, I truly believe that all of these things that I'm about to show you, these 14 competencies, are things that should be taught. I think they should be taught beginning in the first grade, um, and I think they sh we should all be lifelong learners in these subjects. Um, but I hardly ever see anybody taking classes in, in any of this, and um, hopefully that'll change sometime soon. Um, now, clearly these are all sort of somewhat personality traits, but I'm making the strong argument that you can teach somebody to be more curious, right? That you can actually you know, unlock, or at least, you know, one of my theories is that we're all naturally in this state and it all gets beat out of us by the time we're in the third or fourth grade by, you know, any number of dysfunctional teachers who are working in dysfunctional school systems. Um, so for, for adults, I, I actually find it really interesting that you can, you can, there's a lot of muscle memory here and, you know, people are naturally curious. You just have to take away the you know, chip away the stone around them and unlock their natural ability to observe, natural ability. We're all sort of voyeurs in our own way. I mean, there's not one person in this room who doesn't see strangers and make up stories about them. Anybody not do that, right? Like, why is that person that way? And, you know, how did that happen? And we're all sort of naturally in this state. Um, and I think we can return to that state. And I think you can teach people to do it. Um, you know, getting people to, you know, have a sense of their self, um, to realize and understand their own biases and weaknesses. Uh, you know, we're not all good at everything, um, which is a good thing. You just have to be very self-aware of what you are good at um, and be really, really open to constructive criticism and, and coaching. Um, I mean, there's a whole industry of executive coaches that has grown up in the last five or six years uh, around this one one thing, and I, and I think you can literally, I, I'm not necessarily advocating that we have, you know, meditation classes in the third grade, um, but probably wouldn't hurt. Um, I actually believe that you can help people with their vision. You can help people with their ability to imagine and dream. Again, I think we're, we're naturally like this. We remember we, when you used to daydream, um, and you know, it was sort of, you got in trouble for doing it, Right? Um, I'm suggesting that we should, we should like reward people for doing it, not get them into trouble. Um, ideation is a, a sort of magic uh, lesson to learn. Um, you know, how to, how to actually turn these insights into, um, you know, into ideas and how to do, how to brainstorm effectively without judgment. Um, how to go through learning loops and iteration loops um, and, and not try to do what school uh, and corporate America try to, try to make us do, which is to make the perfect thing first. Um, make a whole bunch of crappy things first so that you can get to the perfect thing sooner. 
Um, discovery is a super important uh, trait that, again, I think you can teach people. It's closely related to, um, to curiosity, but the ability to actually recognize patterns um, is, in my opinion, uh, second maybe only to the ability to be empathic are, is, the, is the secret sauce of innovation, right? Um, this is from that movie, Beautiful Mind, which is, um, granted he was a schizophrenic, maybe psychotic, but um, the ability to actually look at two dis disparate things and connect them is, you know, when I was interviewing a lot of people for IDEO, it was the one thing I was always looking for. You know, I could put down, you know, a cough drop and um, an iPhone, and if somebody could tell me an interesting story about the relationship between these two, these two things, very di different things, that was really impressive to me. I'm not sure I could even think of one myself right now, but um, so uh, this 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 notion of being able to kind of put disparate things together and and sort of use serendipity uh, is just a magic. Um, I think it goes way beyond just pure intelligence. It's a different kind of intelligence. Um, flexibility is super important. I know, especially in corporate America and school, everybody, you know, are in these rigid structures. Um, but being able to sort of realize that you're, in, that you're, you know, living in a prevailing paradigm and break out of it, um, break away from past situations and past experiences, um, and be you know, highly agile and flexible are just, you know, is just a, a gift if you can re, if you can relearn it. And I do mean relearn it. I think we're all, again, naturally in a pretty flexible state. Um, problem solving, this is my best picture of problem solving. Um, you know, it's a, it's an important thing. Um, I would actually argue that um, opportunity identification is even more important. Um, but, you know, the, this ability to sort of creatively listen and understand what the problem is and reframe it is just, you know, a golden um, nugget for everyone. I mean, it, it, there was almost never a case at IDEO when I was there when a client would ask, would give us a, a, a project where we would actually do the project that they gave us. They almost always were asking, you know, uh, the wrong question. and much of the value that we created was in, in really delivering a different question to them, not a different answer. So, um, you know, be very, very aware when you're solving what kind of problem and whether it's the right problem to solve, right? Or you'll end up with a faster horse. Uh, integration is the toughest one, uh, especially these days. You know, the business model, the brand issues, the manufacturing issues, the design issues, the ergonomic issues, you know, are there, there are just so many things to try to, you know, bring together into one, um, you know, one idea, one product, one service. Um, and this is why a diverse group is almost always essential to the process. Um, clearly, uh, you know, if you can't put an English sentence together, you're at a bit of a loss here. Um, but the ability to sort of passionately promote and sell is, is really a gift. I think we can all do it. Uh, I think my personal opinion is the ones, people that are good at it have magically found something they're really passionate in. I've never seen somebody who's a terrible salesperson of something that they're passionate about, right? So if you find yourself like working for somebody or in a class that you're really not interested in, you know, quit or find another class. Um, you know, you, have, you only get to do this once, and nobody gets out of this alive. So you, you might as well, like, pursue your passion and being, be able to tell compelling stories about it. Um, one of the, of the clear uh, leading attributes of entrepreneurs is their ability to be persistent, sometimes maddeningly so, uh, in the face of all kinds of odds um, and disapproval and friction and, um, you know, uh, physics and science that's, that's telling them at every, at every point that this is impossible, uh, entrepreneurs seem to have this magic gift of persistence. Um, and and I, I believe that uh, 
that we, we have uh, this sort of precious opportunity right now to, you know, keep this in our curriculums and it shows up in the form of sports activities and, you know, teamwork like in band and choir and these are the things that are being cut out of our education system um, that, that help kids, especially young kids, learn, you know, about commitment and tenacity. So um, if you have an opportunity to um, vote and vote somebody who's like not cutting education, probably a good idea. Uh, collaboration is, is, is key here. I mean, I always ask this question, has anybody in this room ever taken a class in teamwork? Yeah, usually around here, it's a little bit, you know, you're living in a little rarefied uh, atmosphere here at Northwestern because there is a, a focus on, um, on teamwork and collaboration. Uh, but out there in the real world, uh, which hopefully you will change back into this world, um, collaboration, teamwork is just absolutely critical. I think people, human beings are, are sort of naturally um, like this. Uh, we're, we're, we're kind of pack animals in a way. We like, you know, we like the family unit. Um, and, you know, but strangely, we've walled each other off with cubicles and offices and, and uh, created an environment where this can't happen. But um, I think we need to recreate it. Um, I'm not going to get deeply into the, the world of ethics because it gets a little political, other than to say that, um, you know, honesty and authenticity is sort of important to the world of entrepreneurship. And I know there are a lot of, you know, sort of strange swindler types that operate, you know, in the business world. Um, just try to steer, steer clear of those people and, you know, keep your center as much as possible. Um, that takes a lot of courage. Um, you know, to, to learn from failure, to sort of take on, you know, crazy odds uh, isn't the easiest thing in the world, um, but it's absolutely essential. And, and again, I think, you know, we can, we can help teach people. I'd love to see, you know, some rock climbing walls in high schools and grade schools these days, if, you know, but the lawyers would probably talk us out of that. Um, and last but not lead, least, um, I do think you can teach people to be leaders. Uh, and be leaders in the right way, um, not in the, in the dysfunctional ways that we're seeing out there in the world. Um, I think one of the emerging themes that you're going to see um, uh, in the world, and, and it's going to show up, I think, first and foremost in, in politics, is the difference between a great manager and a great leader. There are a lot of people um, that are going to run for many offices that claim, that, that claim to be and probably are very good managers. The question is, are they really good leaders? And just because you're a good manager doesn't mean you're a good leader. Um, so this is, a, this is a really interesting one to watch. So with that, I'm going to leave you with my uh, all-time favorite quote. And I'm about to prove to you that this is true. Um, any aerospace people or physics people in the room? OK, so you guys have to back me up on this, all right? So it turns out that. Um, being in orbit, quote unquote flying, is about falling and missing, right? Um, so, you know, for those of you who think that being in orbit, like people, you know, satellites and space shuttles stay in orbit by um, this magical thing called centrifugal force, the physicists in the room will, will agree with me that there is no such thing as centrifugal force, that the two forces involved are, one of them is literally gravity, pulling the space shuttle down to Earth. And the other one is literally the momentum of the space shuttle constantly falling into Earth and missing. That's what an orbit is. So in fact, Doug Adams was spot on correct, believe it or not. OK. Um, I run over a little bit, but that's it. And um, I, I can answer some questions. I know there are probably a bunch of ones. Did I piss anybody off? Damn. And I, I have failed. I have failed if I didn't. We're, we're all okay. But we do want to thank you for coming out. This okay. is a super sweet space pen that writes upside down. Ooh, so nice. Right outside, folks. Wh why do I need to write upside down? Who knows? Just in case. Right? Wait, this is perfect. Look at that. Thank you so much. I usually get, you know, I have a whole closet full of uh, uh, Kellogg and Northwestern uh, uh, garb, which wow. you're welcome to take anytime you want. Okay, any quick questions? Yeah. How do you feel about, uh, I know you're talking about being the perfect model. A lot of times marketing basically doesn't understand when something's a prototype versus where it's at. 
How do you feel about 3D prototyping, the ability to create these sort of perfect models that you can print versus doing something quick and dirty using stuff on the office? Well, it's, I guess it's a little bit of a, I have a little conflict with it. I mean, on the one hand, making a lot of reasonable models is a good thing as long as you're making a lot of them. On, on the other hand, you know, just because the more perfect they are, the less great feedback you're going to, you're going to get. Um, I thought you were, where you were going to go is, is, a, is a better place, which is, you know, most of the innovation that's still happening out of the world is driven by marketing people, and they're the, exactly the wrong people to actually be driving innovation. Um, I mean, they're, they're, because they're constantly looking through that evaluative lens. Will it sell? Is there a market? What will my commission be? How can I spin this story and make this look like a you know, new and improved thing when in fact it's really not, right? I mean, you know, there's a dramatic need for marketing person. I, I, I have a marketing education, but it's, it's, it's a bad sign. It was always a bad sign to me when the marketing people were driving, right? Is there a way to take it out of their hands? <laughs> um, it is happening, and you know, strangely, Companies often have these huge marketing and advertising budgets and these little, you know, pathetic research and development budgets, but that is, that landscape's changing a bit. So, there's hope. Yeah? The answer is multifunctional groups, where they pull those together in companies. Right. That's one, I think that's one of the transitions you're seeing, right? And then you get, you know, train wrecks of, and fur flighting, you know, between marketing people and engineers and designers. I mean, there's nothing more fun than to watch marketing people, designers, and engineers in the same room. Right? I, t I actually, you know, anybody here in the new Vention program? I mean, yeah. I mean, that's, that's like Feinberg uh, medical students, uh, Northwestern law students, McCormick engineering students, and Kellogg business students slammed onto, together into teams um, for the purpose of innovating. And it is a train wreck. At the beginning, right? Oh, yeah. And then eventually you, the diversity kicks in and they actually gain from the diversity. But it's fun to watch every year, <laughs> really. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, yeah, quick. So I really enjoyed the, uh, the competency you went through. Um, so now I have an unmet need of trying to improve myself on all those elements. Can you expand maybe on a few of the key ones and, and maybe? How to get yourself to improve those? Yeah, the, the two, the two that, uh, and, you know, that, that are kind of woven through a lot of them, like, uh, is it pattern recognition and empathy, right? Um, how, you know, I, I could probably speak for hours about, you know, practice that you could do. Um, I mean, we all know how to be a little, we, we naturally know how to be a little bit more empathic. Um, but like studying it and really practicing it and really, you know, trying to listen in a, in a different way than you're typically listening, listening with all your senses. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are, you know, pattern recognition classes that you could probably take, but I'm really talking about pattern recognition at a higher level. Um, it, it is about practice, and I think what happens in practice is you realize you have more natural ability. It's, it's not like... Um, skiing where you know it actually is something you need to learn to do I think it's just natural to human beings so you have to kind of unlearn all of the things that are blocking um, in both pattern recognition and empathy so yeah I mean I, I'm in the I'm in the we're in the process a group of people are in the process of actually trying to figure out some curriculums based on these things um, it, but it, it is it is what we've realized is it's more about, you know, unlocking and unblocking the, the sort of natural human tendencies than it is more than it is about teaching something specific. Um, but you know, I, I like the exercise of, I mean, a lot of this is just exercises. You know, get two disparate things and put them down on a table and try to make a story about how they relate. You know, I mean, really disparate things. You know, get a, a bottle of wine and a, you know. A kangaroo. I don't know. Just figure it out. But the more you do it, the more you'll realize that, that it's exercising a really good muscle that you already have. It's just a little atrophied usually. <laughs> right. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>